Whether you're into retro consoles or vintage computers, one thing we all have to deal with is analog video. These days we're blessed to have giant flat panels and fancy upscalers, but those things also have a tendency to reveal all the flaws in our analog video signals. In the days of the CRT, it didn't really matter so much. The screens were smaller and there was a certain softness to a CRT that still can't be replicated. And it seems the creators of our favorite retro hardware didn't put too much emphasis on getting video quality just right. Pretty much if it worked with the CRT and synced up and you could see it somewhat, then it was probably good enough. But hooking those devices up to modern display equipment quickly reveals some of the issues that our CRTs were hiding. Poor brightness and contrast levels, jail bars, off colors and just general noise are some of the things I think we've all had to deal with. And while certain upscalers may be good at hiding some of those issues, they're still going to be there unless you deal with them at the source. And that's what this video is all about. I'm going to be showing a bunch of ways to deal with analog video and hopefully by the end of this video you'll not only understand the causes of some of these issues, but also potential ways to fix them on your favorite retro console or computer. So let me grow some hair, let's get started. Hey everyone and welcome to the Retro Channel and today we're taking a deep dive into analog video signals. We'll be taking a look at a system that outputs some pretty rough analog video and seeing if we can do some simple modifications to clean that up. So the main thing we're going to be using is my video debug board. This was designed to take in analog video signals from a number of different sources and provide an easy way to probe these signals using an oscilloscope. So if you're playing along at home, you're definitely going to need a scope for this. And you'll probably also want to pick up one of these boards. They're available on my Tindy store. It just makes life a little bit easier when you're trying to do this sort of work. So the system I've chosen to look at is the master system. This has RGB video output along with composite video and RF, although we're not going to be looking at RF, but it does make for a nice power base for us to study RGB video signals along with composite video. And we'll even take a look at S video signals, even though this console doesn't output S video. Part of the reason that I chose it was because the lovely Adrian Black of Adrian's Digital Basement came across an S video mod for one of these and asked me my thoughts on it. And that led to me falling down a bit of a rabbit hole with the master system and I ended up looking at all aspects of the video output from this thing and tidying it up where I could. I have since reverted those changes just for the sake of this video so we can go through this together. So when I first started looking at the master system, all I had on hand was this RGB SCART cable. This is actually made by Mr. Lurch. Uh, he made it for my master system two, which he RGB modded some time ago. But I figured as the master system one uses the same DIN connector, surely it's gonna work, right? So I went ahead, plugged it into the retro tink, and this is what I got. Yeah, that ain't right. So clearly we have an issue, and some of you might have already guessed the cause of the problem, but to make life easier, let's hook it up to this little test board and take a look at these signals on the oscilloscope. But before we get all silly with the scope, let me thank our channel sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay are your one-stop shop for PCB prototyping and assembly, CNC machining, and so much more. They're also introducing the option to have a custom image printed on your circuit board. This is perfect for anyone who really wants to customize their PCBs. We thank PCBWay for sponsoring today's video. So I brought over the oscilloscope, this is a 4 channel 70 MHz bandwidth scope, but you definitely don't need something like this to do these tests. Uh, you can pretty much get away with one channel and maybe 20 MHz bandwidth at most, but I like using this scope and we can also get a direct capture from it. So all I'm going to do is plug our SCART connector into the video debug board, and this provides 75 ohm termination for the various video signals that you'll normally get from a SCART connector or composite video, S-video, component video even. The reason we want 75 ohm termination is because that's what most analog video signals expect to see on the other side of the cable. So the 75 ohm termination would normally be provided by your display or capture device. We're just basically mimicking that setup on this board so that we can get accurate readings when we go to take a measurement. So this board provides a nice place to clip your ground lead. And then you've got these hoops here, which you can hook onto with your oscilloscope probe to measure the actual signals. And it is labeled what signals we expect to see on these pins and their ideal voltage level. So we know for SCART that it has a sync signal and it's got RGB in this case, because we're dealing with RGB SCART. So let's just first start off with this first pin, 
it could have composite video, which also provides a source for the sync pulses when you're dealing with RGB SCART. It could have a Luma signal, which again also provides a sync source, or it could have C-Sync, which is sometimes referred to as composite sync, not to be confused with composite video, which has all the video information. C-Sync only carries the horizontal and vertical sync pulses, and that's enough to get RGB working. That's all we need because all the actual video information is stored in the RGB color lines. So with everything connected, let's power on the master system and see what we get. So what we're seeing here is the horizontal sync pulses and every so often you'll see a little blip and that'd be the vertical sync pulses, which obviously don't happen as often. The horizontal sync pulses are there to tell the electron gun when it reaches one side of the screen to go back and start drawing a new line. And the vertical sync pulses are there for when it reaches the bottom of the screen to tell it to go back up to the top of the screen and start drawing a new field. So it does look like we have a sync signal, but it is fairly noisy, and that could be what's causing our messed up display when we first powered this thing on. What I'm gonna do is bring up our cursors on the oscilloscope. This just provides an easy way to get a rough idea of our peak-to-peak -peak voltage levels. For composite sync, generally you're looking for at least 300 millivolts. You can probably go up to one volt on composite sync, but you don't wanna see anything higher than that for a SCART connection. There are some devices that use TTL level sync, so that's zero to five volts, but that's a lot less common. Generally, you'll only see that used on maybe some Extron video scalers, but in most cases, one volt peak to peak or lower is what you wanna see for composite sync. So I've set up the cursors at sort of the midpoint of these signals. So the bottom cursor is sort of in the middle of all that noise and the top cursor is doing the same. And if we take a look, we have a sync voltage level of 168.7 millivolts according to the delta Y figure. That's basically the voltage range between the top and bottom cursor. So if I move one of these around, you'll see that change. So it would appear that the voltage level is a little bit low and it is also very noisy for a sync signal. You'd expect that to look more like a clean square wave. So there is a good possibility that we just have a bad sync signal, but while we're here, let's check out the red, green, and blue signals. So looking at a red signal, we can see obviously something's being drawn to the screen because it's constantly changing and the voltage level looks yeah, okay, 473 millivolts, but we're not really set up to test the overall voltage levels of the RGB signals just yet. We'll come back to that later. Uh, in terms of noise, it does look slightly better than C-Sync. Let's just go back to that. Oh yes, there's definitely less noise on the red channel. The green channel looks about the same as the red, maybe slightly less noisy. And the blue channel looks about the same, maybe slightly more noisy. So obviously our sync signal isn't good enough for the retro tink to lock onto and that's why we saw sort of a messed up garbage display because it can't actually see those sync pulses in there. So there's a couple of possibilities here. Maybe the master system has some kind of fault and it's not outputting a clean sync signal. Maybe there's something wrong with this cable or perhaps there's some components inside this cable that are throwing everything off. A lot of these SCART cables that you pick up will have either capacitors or resistors or both inside these things. And uh, that's to sort of massage the video signals into the proper spec, but uh, they don't always get it right. And uh, it's very system specific. So um, let's take a look inside this cable first, make sure there's no components that are messing with our sync signal. So let's pop open this cable, see what we can see. Now, most of the components are usually gonna be hidden inside the SCART head if you're dealing with a SCART connector. Otherwise, there could be stuff hidden inside this DIN plug. So let's check both ends. The DIN plug is pretty easy to get open. And uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any components in there. They're all just directly soldered to that DIN connector. So no issues there. Now with SCART plugs, usually this part will unscrew, but as you can see, this one doesn't budge, and that's because it's not a real screw-on thread. This is just ultrasonically welded together. So you can see that there is a seam down the side here, and when you're dealing with this kind of stuff, the easiest way is just to get a sharp blade or a scalpel and just sort of cut along that seam until it eventually pops open. And because I've already opened this before, that seal is already broken, so it should pop open again pretty easily. Now, it may also be tempting just to use a multimeter and try and check the cable from one end to the other, but as I said, there could be resistors or capacitors in here or a combination of both, so you're not always going to get accurate readings with a multimeter. It's much easier just cracking open the case, even when they're ultrasonically welded. 
And what we see inside the SCART connector are indeed some resistors and capacitors. These are all sitting on the RGB lines, so we're not necessarily interested in those at the moment. There is also another resistor hiding under here. And this looks to be being used for the SCART blanking and function switching, which uh, we're not going to deal with right now. The main thing we're interested in is pin 20 of the SCART connector, which is our yellow wire, and that will be carrying our composite sink. And as we can see, there's no components connected to our C-Sync pin. So the issue doesn't appear to be with the cable. It seems to be with the console itself. So let's take a look inside the master system. There are a couple of different versions of the Master System 1. This is one of the older revisions and it uses a Sony V7040 video amplifier chip. The later ones use a Sony CXA something something. So the particular mods that I'm going to show in this video may only work on the older models if you've got the CXA model. Hopefully you'll learn enough from this video to be able to figure out something for that particular revision. And thanks to the internet, we have the schematics for the Master System 1, although they're not very legible. We also have the data sheet for the V7040 video encoder, and we know that pin 1 on the DIN connector is our composite sync line. So let's focus on that data sheet, and just looking at it at a glance, I can't see a composite sync output. There is pin 11, which is C-Sync in, but I don't see a C-Sync out. And the Master System 1 schematics that we have also seem to be of little use. So let's try and trace this out ourselves, see where that composite sync signal is actually coming from. So pin 1 on the DIN connector is this one here, so I'm just going to stick a little pin in there just because my probes won't actually fit in there. And we'll just see where that goes. Okay, it's going to this point here. And you may notice there's a little bodge wire here, that's actually from me reversing the mods that I'd already done. We'll soon find out why I had to put a bodge wire there. So I've just got one probe on that side and it appears to go to this tiny little trace running next to this can. Yes, it does. So it goes there back through a via. So that's going to be this point, this point. It goes from there to there. This is the fun part of trying to trace out boards. I guess an alternative way to do this would be to take photos of each side of the board and try and line them up in GIMP, but uh, we're not going to be doing that. And it goes to that via just there, somewhere under our V7040, so I can probably just do a bit of this. Yes, there it is. So it's going to pin 14, 13, 12, pin 11. And as we saw on the data sheet before, pin 11 is composite sync into the video mixer chip and it doesn't have a composite sync output. So it looks like what they've done is just routed the composite sync input to that chip over to the DIN connector and just called that composite sync output. But obviously it is not enough to drive an actual display. Now, I don't know if the CXA version also has the same issue. I think the CXA chip, as opposed to this V7040 chip, does actually have a dedicated composite sync output. So it probably works fine on those machines. It's probably only the V7040 models that are actually affected by this. I guess back when this was made, they figured everyone would either be using RF or maybe composite video, possibly RGB, but it's pretty unlikely that anyone would have had any use for C-Sync back then. So they probably figured no one would notice, but uh, we notice now. So I think we have two options. We can either just use composite video for our sync source, and that would just mean we just need to change one wire in this DIN connector, or we can try and turn the C-Sync signal from this board into something useful. So of course we're going to do it the hard way and try and restore the C-Sync signal, and once again our little video debug board is going to come in handy for this. So I've just reconnected everything, we'll just power this thing on. We're not actually worried about seeing the video output from this because we know it currently looks all screwed up. What I'm going to do is take off one of these little jumpers, specifically the composite video or C-Sync line, and then just hook the multimeter probe onto this leftmost pin. So by removing the jumper, we've also removed the connection to the 75 ohm termination resistor. So now we're not terminated to a display, we should see something a little different on the scope. And indeed, we see something very different. In fact, the signal itself looks pretty clean now. And according to our cursors, the overall voltage is around 5 volts. So that's actually TTL sync level. But once we add the 75 ohm termination, 
it drops down to practically nothing. So that just confirms that the C-Sync signal on this board wasn't actually designed to drive a display. As soon as we connected a load to it with our 75 ohm resistor, the voltage level is just collapsed. So it's not able to supply enough current and therefore the voltage level also drops with it. So a simple way to overcome this is to create a little buffer circuit. This can be done using a simple NPN transistor. In this case, I'm gonna use a 2N2222 because I use them a lot. So all we need to do is connect the base to C-Sync. The collector can go to VCC or five volts and then the emitter will become our buffered C-Sync output. Normally you'd wanna add in a few other components to make sure the transistor is correctly biased, but in this case, we don't really need to worry about it and we're trying to keep these mods as simple as possible. So once again, we're gonna remove this jumper and this board is actually gonna help us build a little circuit. What I have here is just a tiny little breadboard and some little DuPont connectors. So what we're gonna do is take a male to female connector Stick one end on that pin and run it to the breadboard. And then with another one, we're gonna take that from the breadboard back to the other pin. So what we've effectively done is created a little break in the signal path and that'll allow us to insert our own components. The other thing we're gonna need, of course, is five volts. And I'm just gonna grab that from this RAM IC over here. On our 2N2222, the rightmost pin is the collector. So that's gonna to go to five volts. Middle pin is base, which is gonna to go to our input signal. And then the emitter is our output, so that's gonna go into there. And then head back to our oscilloscope probe and we still have our 75 ohm termination. So let's see if this actually works. Let's power on. And bam, we have a nice juicy composite sync signal. A little too juicy. So we can see that we still have roughly around five volts we're obviously gonna have a little bit lower because of the diode drop in the transistor. So we're looking at around four volts now, which is a little bit too high. We wanna try and get that down to one volt or less. So an easy way to do that is just to throw in a resistor. So I'm just gonna move this connection over a little bit and we'll stick in a resistor in between. No doubt there's a formula to work out the exact resistance value that we need, but I'm very much a visual guy, so I need to actually see it to believe it. So what I'm gonna be using is a decade box. This basically just has a bunch of resistors inside and using these little dials, we can set an exact resistance value. This is a lot easier than just grabbing a bunch of individual resistors and sticking them in and out of circuit, trying to find the right value. So we'll connect one end to one side and one end to the other. And I usually just leave this set around one kilo ohm, just so it's not a short circuit as soon as I hook something up. And with 1K, there is a very small signal coming through, but that's probably a bit too small. So I'm gonna turn this to 900 and turn that to zero. So now we're at 900 ohms. And I'm just gonna keep going down until I see something that looks to be usable, something around one volt preferably. So I've just set up the cursors to where one volt would be, and I'm just gonna keep going down until, whoop, and we've gone too far. So let's start turning up this dial. So to get one volt with 75 ohm termination, we need a resistor value of 230 ohms or thereabouts. The standard resistor values that I have are either 220 or 270. So I'm actually gonna go for 270 because like I said, it just needs to be above 300 millivolts. It doesn't actually need to be the full one volt. So 270 should offer us plenty. And we now have a peak to peak voltage of 915 millivolts, which is perfectly fine. It's not too high that it might potentially damage something. And it's not so low that things are gonna to struggle to lock onto the actual sync pulses. So the only thing we need to do now is stick these components into the actual signal path on the master system and not have them just coming off our little breakout here. So one option may be to stick the components inside the actual cable, probably inside the SCART head, but that means that you have this specific cable for this specific console, and I don't particularly wanna do that. So instead, we're gonna make some changes on the board itself. And this is where my little bodge wire comes into play. So let's just remove this thing. It's probably impossible to see on camera, but what I actually ended up doing was cutting that trace. That's why the bodge wire is there. And yes, there's no continuity there. Now, I'm not a huge fan of cutting traces, uh, but in this case, there wasn't a component that I could just lift one leg of. I mean, it goes straight to the uh, video encoder I see, so it's not like I can lift a leg of that very easily. So it's much easier just to cut this little trace and that'll allow us to insert our little buffer circuit. 
So to keep this as neat as possible, I'm gonna try and stick our transistor directly on the board here. Uh, the base of the transistor is gonna to go to this little via here next to the trace that we cut. The emitter is gonna go through that 270 ohm resistor to this point here, which is pin one of the DIN connector. And then we just need to find five volts to connect to the collector. So I've just trimmed some of these legs just so we can get it to sit roughly around there. I'll just put a bit of heat shrink over that leg. All right, and that should be it. Our collector is now going to five volts. The base is going to the original C-Sync signal and the emitter is going through this 270 ohm resistor to the C-Sync on our DIN connector. Let's test it out. Now I could be reckless and just plug this straight into the retro tink, but it's worth just double checking our work uh, just before we potentially break something. Power on. We get nothing. We haven't plugged in power. Let's try that again. Yep, that looks pretty good. I'm happy with that. Let's see if we now get a proper image. Looking good. Hey, that's so much better. We actually have a stable image. Now, of course, it would have been just as easy to use composite video for sync, but uh, where's the fun in that? So while we seem to have sorted out the sync issue, I can still see a couple more problems. Let's take a look at Sonic here. And two things I see, one, there is some very fine vertical jail bars in the image. And the other one would be a lack of contrast. Take the timer up the top, for example, that should be pure white. And it is certainly not that. Let's load up the 240p test suite and just head into full colors and we'll just set the screen to white. The idea here is that all the RGB signals should now be at their full intensity in order to make a white image. So let's head back to the oscilloscope and take a look at these RGB signals. And yes, I have had a haircut. It's fine, we were all thinking it. So I'm just gonna unplug the controller just so I don't accidentally hit a button and we'll disconnect this from the retro tink and plug it back into our test board. So we know that our sync is good. Let's check out the RGB lines. And for an ideal RGB signal, they should all be at 700 millivolts peak to peak. And we can already see that we certainly don't have that. We'll bring up the cursors again. And we can see from the bottom, which would be black, to the top of our signal, which would be full intensity, that we have 459 millivolts for red, and about the same for green, and around the same for blue. And yes, blue is definitely noisier. That might be what's causing our vertical jail bars. So before we go searching for the root cause of the jail bars, let's try and fix this voltage problem. So we need to get back up to 700 millivolts and unlike the C-Sync signal where we could just be near enough anywhere between 300 millivolts and one volt, we wanna get ideally spot on 700 millivolts for this. And unlike the C-Sync signal where we need to create a little buffer, remember that we've got some components on the RGB lines inside this SCART head. So let's go back in and check those out. So it looks like we've got a 75 ohm resistor on the RGB lines going to a 220 microfarad capacitor. Now the capacitor is there just to remove any DC offset from the RGB lines, which is something that you should do, even though the display device should be able to clamp those properly, but you definitely don't want to send, you know, five or 10 volts into your display device. So that's what the capacitors are for, and they may or may not be required. We'll check that out shortly but certainly those resistors are gonna have a voltage drop across them. So it may just be a case of just removing those resistors and that might bring us back up to 700 millivolts, but there's a surefire way to find out. Let's remove those resistors. So I'm just gonna remove this wire from what looks like the red line and instead we're gonna connect it directly to the SCART head. So we're basically bypassing both that resistor and capacitor. Let's see what our red signal looks like now. Ooh, okay, it is off the scale. So there is definitely a DC offset there. You can see that the bottom line is around 1.5 volts and the top of that signal is around 2.5 volts. So that immediately tells me that we definitely need that capacitor installed. We don't wanna send 1.5 volts into our display device. It's better to have that centered around zero volts in this case. So let me just put that capacitor back in line, but we'll still bypass the resistor. All right, and we're now centered around zero volts, which is good. Let's see what our peak to peak value looks like. And it looks like we're now sitting at 918 millivolts. So a little over the 700 that we want, which means we will need a resistor, but definitely not a 75 ohm resistor. So once again, we'll use our decade box to figure out what we need. 
So in this case, all we need to do is remove our jumper, install some DuPont connectors, and let's just set this to 75 because that's what the original resistor was, and then we'll just go down from there. And as expected, we're back around 400 and something millivolts. So let's just move the cursors up to around 700. And we'll just start lowering this resistance. Yeah, that seems to be spot on. So we're at 13 ohms, pretty low. So standard values that I have are either 12 or 15 ohms. I think in this case I'll go for 15 because there's probably a little bit of resistance in all these cables. So all we want to do is keep the capacitor in there and remove this old resistor and stick in our own. So the 75 is out and our 15 is in. Let's just do one more quick check. And it looks like we are, ooh, we're actually slightly above the figure. Uh, 759. What I should have done is check these leads with the multimeter. Yeah, 23 ohms thereabouts. Uh, certainly not the 13 that I thought it was. Could be these leads. I doubt this decade box is very accurate either. Um, it's just a cheapie from AliExpress. But um, yeah, definitely need a slightly higher resistance value. And standard values are either 22 or 27, so I'm going with 22. And it looks like we now have a value somewhere around 706 millivolts. I'd say that's close enough. So we just need to do the same for the other color lines and we should be good. All right, that should do it. A little bit messy and I probably could have used some heat shrink over those, but ah, it'll be fine. So we'll do a quick test of those peak to peak voltages before we go plugging it into the retro tink, just to make sure we didn't screw anything up. So red looks pretty good. Green looks about right. And blue looks pretty good, even though it's quite a lot noisier. So let's plug this into the retro tink, see if we've fixed our contrast issue. Oh yes, and the white definitely looks a lot more white, although I am seeing a tinge of dark gray around the top of the image. That's probably down to those capacitors, so we might actually have to take a look at those as well. But before we do that, let's take a look at Sonic again. And that startup screen definitely looks a lot better as well. Oh yes, and everything looks a lot more vibrant. So one down, two to go. So now we have another issue to deal with, and it's not really a major one. Most of the time you can't even notice it. It's only when we have a full white or just a full solid color that we're gonna see that problem. And you may think this was caused by us changing those resistors, but that issue was there before, it was just being masked by the low contrast. And the cause of this is actually down to these AC coupling capacitors. Although these do work to remove the DC offset, they don't work at every frequency, especially when you get down to lower frequencies like 50 Hertz. Uh, for a 60 Hertz system, a 220 microfarad capacitor might be okay. But for 50 Hertz, we might need something just a little bit higher in capacitance. It probably also doesn't help that these are the old Chong capacitors. Now, again, there's going to be a formula for this, but I'm not that good at explaining those kind of things. I'm not Dave Jones and I don't have a whiteboard. So we're just going to do some more experimentation to find the right values. So once again, we'll use our little debug board and we can actually see this problem happening on the oscilloscope. So right now everything appears normal, but keep in mind we're only looking at a couple of lines of the video information. Let's zoom way back out. And what we're looking at now is a field of video information. So that is one full screen of video information. And you can see there is a slope on that signal. So that's kind of what we're seeing when we look at the actual video output from this thing. The top of the picture starts off slightly brighter and slowly goes down to black towards the bottom. So let's once again make some little changes to our SCART connector. So this time we're going to be removing this capacitor and replacing it with something else. And of course this does create a little bit of a challenge because the higher up in capacitance you go, the larger the actual physical size of the capacitor. These are 330 microfarad 10 volt. We saw that there was around a two and a half volt DC offset over the entire signal. So we could probably use a 6.3 volt capacitor or even a four volt capacitor, but they're not very common. Uh, but all I have here are either 330 microfarad 10 volt or another small size I've got is 470 microfarad 6.3 volt. Let's try out the 330 first and see if that's enough to fix this issue. So just like with this capacitor, we want the negative leg going to the actual SCART head and the positive side going to our resistor. Ooh, and to be honest, that didn't really make much of a difference. I think we're gonna have to go up to 470. 
And with our 470 microfarad, it's looking pretty flat. Uh, we could go up even higher, but like I said, the actual physical size of the capacitor is just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger. And there's only so much you can fit inside a SCART head. So I think 470 should be enough to solve this issue in all but the most extreme cases. All right, 470 caps are in, and I took the opportunity to add some heat shrink over those resistors. Let's plug this into the RetroTink, try it out again. Right, and there we have it. If we look really, really, really closely, you can just see a hint of some very dark gray in the top left corner, but uh, you have to really look for it. And of course, in 99.9% .9 of cases, you're not gonna see that because it's rare to get a solid color covering the entire screen. The last thing to do is deal with these jail bars or the very thin vertical stripes that we can see. And it is definitely more prominent with the blue color. So when we see vertical jail bars like this, it actually means that there's something happening to the video signal at a certain frequency. The closer the jail bars are together, the higher the frequency. So in this case, they are quite tight. If you've seen jail bars on like, say a Commodore 64 or something, you'll notice that they're a lot further apart. So something is happening on the master system at a fairly high frequency, and that's making its way into our video output. Now we'll take a look at the scope in a minute to see if we can catch the exact frequency that it's happening. But another way to do it is just to open up something like Paint 3D here with a screenshot. And if we zoom in, I'm just gonna draw a little selection box and see how many pixels it takes for each jail bar to occur. So for 10 jail bars, it takes about 68 pixels. So that's about 6.8 pixels per jail bar. Now we can do a little bit of math to work out roughly what the frequency is. So we have a jail bar roughly every 6.8 pixels and our visible area of the screen is 1370 thereabouts. Now keep in mind a single line of video actually extends past our visible area because we need room for a bit of overscan and our front and back porches and our sync pulse. So we'll make an educated guess and just say an entire line of horizontal video takes 1920 pixels in this case. So if we take 1920, divide that by 6.8, which was how often every jail bar occurred, and then multiply that by our horizontal scanning frequency, which for PAL is 15625, and TSC is 15750 or something, we get a figure of 4,411 blah blah blah, so 4.41 megahertz basically. Let's see if that matches up with what we see on the scope. So back to our debug board, plug this in here, and we're gonna hook up the scope to our blue channel because at the moment we're only outputting that blue box. And we're gonna zoom way in. So now we've zoomed way in on a single line of video and you can see those little peaks and troughs, they're our jail bars. And if we bring up our cursors, we can work out how often they're occurring. Let's go from that dip to this dip here and we get a figure of 4.424 megahertz. So we were pretty damn close in our estimation. And likewise, the peaks are gonna happen at probably the same frequency. Yeah, around 4.4 megahertz. So there's something on the master system running around that frequency and it's making its way into our video signal and causing those jail bars. So rather than poking around at the master system with our scope trying to find that frequency, let's just do a quick Google search. Here we go, good old SMS power might have the answer. So power systems have a master clock rate of 53.2 megahertz, which is way above what we're seeing and you wouldn't be able to see that in a regular analog video signal. Uh, that's divided by 15 as the system clock. So it's that 3.54 megahertz and the chrominant subcarry frequency is 4.433 megahertz. That's pretty close to what we're seeing on the oscilloscope and some of you might have already guessed what that frequency was related to. If this problem also happens with NTSC systems, those jail bars would be slightly wider apart because the NTSC color subcarrier is 3.58 megahertz thereabouts. So you'd get slightly wider jail bars on an NTSC system, assuming that it's the chrominant subcarrier that's causing this issue. It looks like the NTSC systems also use 3.58 megahertz as the system clock. So it could be a number of things causing the same problem on the NTSC versions. So it looks like on the PAL system, the only thing running at that frequency is the color subcarrier. And that's used to encode color for PAL video. So composite video, S video, and I guess RF. But for RGB, we don't actually use that frequency at all. 
Still, let's try and find out where it's getting into our video signal and see if we can stop that from happening without disabling color altogether. So we want to find the source of the 4.43 megahertz. So I've taken the heatsink off the 7805 voltage regulator and there's nothing too exciting under there, to be honest. It appears that all of our crystals and clock generation circuitry is hidden under this can and uh, it's soldered down onto the board at many points. So I don't really feel like removing it, but thankfully we don't really have to. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I've already tested out most of these mods and just poking around with the scope, I found the 4.43 megahertz comes out here and heads along this trace through a via, which pops out of this side of the board and goes alongside our video encoder IC and ends up at this 3.3K resistor, I believe it is. And then it goes through another resistor, a couple of capacitors, and eventually goes to pin 10 on our video encoder. And if we look at the data sheet for the V7040, pin 10 is labeled SC in, and it is the input for our subcarrier, so our color subcarrier. So there's two possibilities I can think of here. Either there's some capacitive coupling going on, and being as our trace runs directly past the RGB inputs to this chip, that's a possibility. Otherwise, the interference is happening inside this chip, and in that case, there's not a whole lot we can do about it. But what we can do is just cut this trace and you'll notice there is a little bodge wire there because like I said, I've already done this. So I'm just gonna remove that bodge and we'll just check from here over to here and there is no longer a connection. So our 4.43 megahertz isn't making its way over to here and it's not getting encoded by the video chip. So if we were to hook up composite video right now, we'd only get a black and white image because there's no color subcarrier. But for RGB, we don't have to worry about that. And we just want to find out whether or not this is actually going to make a difference. So let's plug this back in, see what kind of picture we get. I'm not going to run this for too long because that voltage regulator will get quite hot. So we'll quickly jump into the test suite and already I can see that the jail bars are completely gone. If we look at the full color patterns, yeah, they look like solid colors. There's no vertical stripes through them anymore. Now all we need to figure out is if the interference is happening inside the chip or if it's just from that trace running so close to those RGB signals. So we know that it comes through this via, down this trace, and to this little resistor here. So what I'm going to do is cut the trace right next to that resistor. We can always reconnect this later on. So now that we've severed that trace at both ends, what we're going to do is reroute this signal directly from this via to our resistor, which is over in this area, and that'll avoid the signal actually going past our RGB color lines. Maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. We're going to find out. So basically all I've done is move this trace from going up here to going down and across here. Ooh, and I can see those jail bars are back. You can definitely see it in the blue again. Although I will say they only look to be present in the blue now. You can't really see them in the red or the green. So let's do some further digging on this board. And I think I can already see the culprit. And mind you, I actually haven't tested this part of the mod because I didn't realize this might be an issue until now. You can see this thick trace that runs up here underneath where our resistor would be. And that goes up to pin three of our video encoder, which happens to be the blue input. So it's possible just having this trace running in between these components is why our blue shows the jail bars. Now I don't particularly want to cut the blue trace, so let's just see if we can move some components around from the top side. So after tracing out the blue signal on the top side of the board, I found it runs up underneath these two resistors and then up under this capacitor and under this resistor as well, which doesn't actually matter for this purpose, it's not related to the uh, video signal, and then into pin three of our chip. So rather than trying to reroute all this stuff, I basically just took out these components that it was running underneath and this capacitor next to it and moved them all to the underside of the board. So now our 4.43 megahertz goes straight into the resistor that was at R20. And from there it goes to R21, which was connected to ground. So I've just found a ground point on the underside. It also goes through C22 and that also connects to ground. And finally through C50, which goes to pin 11 of the V7040. So I've used this little bodge wire here and tried to keep it away from our RGB signals. With any luck, this should be the solution. Oh yeah. 
That looks pretty good. There might be some really faint jail bars. Let's look at the colors. Yeah, white looks pretty solid. Red and green both look solid. And yeah, there's maybe some slight jail bars in the blue. There's also a bit of noise in there. In fact, just, ooh, I just touched that voltage regulator, which is already toasty. So uh, let's just turn that off. I'll stick the uh, heat sink back on this thing and then we'll do some more tests. All right, I put the heat sink back on and just put the bottom case back on because this mat here is an ESD safe mat, so it is grounded. So could be picking up noise from that as well. Let's have a look. There's still a tiny bit of noise in the solid blue screen, but I think I can live with that. I am also using a very cheap SCART cable, which is not shielded. So much like the video issue where noise is getting into the video signal, the noise from the video signal is actually getting into the audio signal in this SCART cable. And that's why we get this random buzzing. And that noise in the blue channel seems to be all over the place. So it might be pretty tricky to track down the source of that. Uh, it could just be poor power filtering. I am using the original power supply for this machine and there's also the original caps on this machine. So it could just be that. So while I could try chase down the source of the other interference, I think of this like a dirty car. We give our car a wash, it takes 15 minutes, but we can appreciate the result but then we start to notice the issues that some of that dirt was hiding. So we give it a polish that takes an hour and then it starts to look really good. But if you look up close, you can still spot some minor issues. And at this point you can spend a few more hours trying to fix them, or you can just take a step back and appreciate how far you've come. Just in case anyone has this same board and is doing these same mods, I did manage to narrow down the source of some of that noise to a 10.5 MHz frequency, which is also one of the clock rates used on the Master System 1. But I think it's time to move on, and I will replace this SCART cable with a proper shielded one in the future. And the only thing I didn't really cover in detail is the function switching and the RGB blanking. A lot of devices won't even use these signals, you can just select the RGB input, but for certain legacy devices like older TVs, they may rely on the function switching pin, which usually carries between 5 and 12 volts to switch over to the SCART input, and the RGB blanking pin to basically blank the display and allow RGB signals through, and that's usually between 1 and 3 volts. I did a quick test with this cable and there's 5 volts on the function switching, which is perfectly fine, and then it goes through a 180 ohm resistor to the RGB blanking, and it gives us about 1.5 volts there, which is also within the one to three volts for RGB blanking. So this should pretty much work with any display, regardless of whether you can switch directly to RGB SCART or not. So that's enough of this shot. Let's move on to composite video. So because I don't have another DIN cable just for composite video, and I don't really feel like changing this SCART cable over to composite, I'm just gonna solder in this little composite video cable just directly to the DIN connector. And that'll do. I will eventually make up a proper composite cable for this machine, but this will do for now. So here we go again. This time we're gonna use the composite video input into our debug board, and this uses the same connector that we used for the SCART syncing. So we'll hook our probe up there and let's see what we get on the scope. All right, well, we do look to have what looks like a pretty normal composite video signal. According to the peak to peak voltage, it's around 966. So it's not over one volt. Uh, generally composite video is spot on one volt from the bottom of the sink tip to the very top, which would be peak white. And we're within that. So that's good enough to hook up to the retro tink. We're not gonna damage anything. And it does look like Wonder Boy is working. Doesn't look great because it's only composite video, but we've got a signal. It's better than what we had when we first tried out the RGB SCART connection. Let's run the 240p test suite, see what we get. So once again, I'm just gonna go for full white and I can already see we have that dark gray at the top of the screen, but we've dealt with that before. So it should be a fairly easy fix. And once again, it doesn't look pure white either. So let's hook it back up to this board now that we have that white pattern on the screen and see what our voltage levels look like. So the scope is reporting 869 millivolts peak to peak. It's gonna be roughly around that area, but we can get a more accurate reading with the cursors because that peak to peak level also includes any overshoot or noise in the signal. So if we set our cursors straight across there, we see 796.8 millivolts, so a little bit off the one volt that we want. But once again, we've already dealt with this sort of issue, so let's take a look, see if we can find a resistor in our circuit path that is lowering that voltage too much. 
So again, I won't bother relying on the schematics because they're not great. We'll just trace this out manually. It almost looks like it goes to this capacitor here. And yes, it certainly does. So through that capacitor, it goes to this resistor. And then through that resistor, it goes, does it go to this cap? No, it goes straight to our V7040 by the looks of it. So it goes from pin 15 of our V7040 through this 75 ohm resistor and then through a 100 microfarad 16 volt capacitor and then out to the DIN connector. So just like the RGB lines, we have a resistor and capacitor in our path and it looks like they're the wrong values, but we've already dealt with this before, so it shouldn't be too hard to do once again. So rather than taking out that resistor just yet, I'm gonna solder a couple of leads in parallel across it, and then we can use our decade box in parallel to work out the exact resistance value that we need. And with our decade box in parallel to the resistor, I'm just gonna set this to couple of hundred ohms, that should be good enough. Let's just power it on, see what voltages we get. Yeah, okay. That seems fine for now. I just want to make sure it's safe to plug into the retro tink. So we'll load up the test suite and get that full white pattern back on the screen and then swap back to the scope. So I've just set the cursor to where one volt peak to peak would be on the scope. Let's just start this running and we'll just adjust this down to where we hit our mark. Yeah, about 80 ohms on the decade box looks about right. Now, so I don't get caught out like last time, let's measure the actual resistance we're getting across this. We see about 97 ohms in total. Oh, I had that set to 83. 97 ohms in parallel to 75 ohms gives us a total resistance of 42.2 ohms. Apparently 39 ohms is the closest standard value. All right, 39 ohm resistor is in. Let's see what we got. Well, yeah, now you can really notice that dark gray at the top of the screen. According to the scope, we're sitting at 1.034 volts. Close enough to one, I'd say. So that's one of the issues sorted, and it should be pretty easy to work out what we need to do with the other one. So that 100 microfarad capacitor has got to go, and we'll stick in a 470, just like we did with the RGB SCART cable. In fact, before we put that new cap in, I'm just going to jump this capacitor. I just want to see what DC offset we actually have on this signal without one. So definitely won't be hooking this up to the retro tink just yet. It'll be safe to hook up to our test board though. It's actually not that bad. If we look at the BY figure, which is the bottom of the sync tip, it's 377 millivolts. So I don't really need a capacitor in there at all. Uh, if it was over one volt, then I'd be worried about it, but, but that should be fine for the retro tink or any other display to handle. One way to find out. Well, we have a display and nothing's exploded. And yeah, that actually looks fine. The uh, retro tink is gonna clamp that signal. So uh, we don't actually need that capacitor in there and we get a nice uniform image without it. The only odd thing is the white looks more like light gray. So let's have a look on the scope again. All right, we've got the right peak to peak voltage level around one volt, uh, but let's have a look. So normally you'd have 300 millivolts as your sync voltage and then 700 millivolts is the actual video information. And we see 368 millivolts as the sync voltage, which is gonna leave 634 millivolts as the video information. So our ratios are a little bit off. And I don't know if it applies to all displays and devices, but certainly the RetroTink here seems to use the sync voltage to work out the peak black and peak white levels. So if we have our standard one volt composite video signal, we can divide that by 3.33 to get our 300 millivolts. So because we have 368 millivolts as our sync voltage, the overall voltage should be 1.22 volts. The problem here is if we just try and lower this resistance value, we're gonna send more than one volt into our display device and that's not a good thing for composite video. And the sync tip voltage is just gonna increase with that. So really what we need to do is try and lower that sync tip voltage without affecting the rest of the video signal. And this is the point where things can get quite complicated, but I wanna keep all these mods as simple as possible and hopefully as digestible as possible. So rather than looking at clamps and DC restoration circuits, I think there is an easier way to do this. We know we have around a 400 millivolt DC offset on our signal. So what if we just use something like a diode just to lower that voltage and while we're at it, just cut off a little bit extra of the bottom of that sink tip. 
So once again, I'm just going to use a breadboard to insert our own component in the signal chain. And we'll just use a random diode. I think this is a 4148. So we'll stick that in there and see what that does. Our voltage level has been reduced. So the bottom of our sink tip is now sitting at around 24 millivolts, pretty damn close to zero. And our sink voltage is now spot on 300 millivolts. Let's see if we still have, what have we got up here? Ooh, overall voltage level is now 900 millivolts. So it's not quite right. It's pretty close though. So for 900 millivolts, we want to see a sink level of 270 millivolts. Mm. So we might have to settle for near enough. It's certainly better than what we had without a diode and definitely better than what we had with that capacitor in there. So yeah, I'd say it's pretty good. I might lower that resistor value again because now that we've got this diode in there, it's lowered the overall voltage level, but yeah, it's pretty close. So in the end, I swapped out the resistor at R27 for a 27 ohm and the capacitor at C28 is now a 1N4148 diode and seems to give pretty decent results for composite. Now, if you're wondering why even bother with composite when we've got RGB, it seems they use the softness of composite video to provide a bit of a dithering effect with those trees. It's also visible somewhat in the title screen as well. So we've now cleaned up RGB and composite using very simple components, just off the shelf stuff, no fancy FPGAs or anything like that. So the final piece of this puzzle is adding S-Video. Now, of course, this isn't gonna be possible if the console doesn't have anywhere to tap the S-Video signals from. Thankfully, the V7040 does have both a Luma and Chroma output on pins 13 and 14. So we can pick them up from there. But of course, once again, we're gonna to have to massage those signals a little bit in order to get them into spec. First thing I'm gonna do is just solder this S-Video connector onto the board here, and then we'll take a look at the signals and work out what we need to do with them. It's all very messy, but that should be good enough. Let's plug it into our debug board. And this time we're gonna be using the yellow and the red connector. So yellow should have our Luma signal and red should have our Chroma signal. But before I go powering this on, I'm just gonna remove our 75 ohm termination because we're not even sure if this signal can even handle being terminated to 75 ohms. It can be risky terminating those signals straight away because you might pull too much current from this chip and it probably won't like that. So let's just try this without being terminated. And we do indeed see a Luma signal there, although it looks pretty small and it does have a fairly high DC offset. And maybe it's not too bad. We have a peak to peak voltage level of 1.234 volts and a DC offset of 1.58 volts. So not too bad. Let's see what happens when we add termination. Oh yes, and we can see that it's dropped to a flat line. So it's definitely not able to supply enough current to be terminated at 75 ohms. So we're probably gonna need a buffer on the Luma signal, but before we get into that, in fact, I better remove that jumper, let's have a look at the Chroma signal. And yeah, the Chroma signal looks pretty standard. Let's see. Around 700 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, chroma should be around 300 millivolts peak to peak, so it's definitely over that. And we've got a DC offset of around two volts. Let's see what happens when we try and add 75 ohms to this. Oh yes, and with termination, we're only seeing 100 millivolts there, so it doesn't really like that too much either. Let's focus on the chroma signal first. So we can add a capacitor in there to remove that DC offset because chroma can be centered around zero volts DC. So let's just throw in, this is a one nanofarad capacitor. As we saw before with the RGB signals, we needed a 470 microfarad capacitor to remove the DC offset. And that's because this thing had 50 Hertz sync pulses in there. With the chroma signal, it's all just high frequency information. So the higher the frequency, the lower capacitance value you need. So in this case, one nanofarad may just be enough to remove the DC offset. And it's actually pretty close to what we want. Uh, it's around 400 millivolts, so a little bit high. So because we removed the DC offset, it can now supply more current with our 75 ohm termination, and therefore the voltage level has actually increased. It's actually a little bit more than we want now. 
So we just need to add a little resistor into this path as well. And we should be able to get this around 300 millivolts with no DC offset and no buffer required. So we'll set this up to go through our decade box and that is a little bit too high. So it looks like something around 80 ohms, maybe 70. In fact, 75 is a common figure. And yeah, that looks pretty good. So if we do a 75 ohm resistor and a one nanofarad capacitor in series on the chroma line, that should be enough to sort that out. And then all we need to worry about is the luma signal. So once again, we'll use a 2N2222, stick that in here. Gonna need five volts, which is gonna go to the collector. We're gonna hook up the luma signal coming from the master system to the base. And we'll connect the emitter to our 75 ohm output. That's actually pretty good. Uh, it's basically one volt peak to peak. What's the sync level look like? Ooh, again, where we're at around 400 millivolts, which is gonna cause the same issue we saw with uh, the composite video. So after a bit of experimentation, I've come up with two options. We can either have just the transistor there, and in which case we get sync at around 390 millivolts, a DC offset of about 950 millivolts, and an overall voltage level of pretty much one volt peak to peak, which is the only good part about that. The other option is we can put a diode in there after the transistor, and in that case, we get a sync pulse of around 340 millivolts, a DC offset of only 220 millivolts, and an overall voltage level of around 956. I think in this case, I'm gonna keep the diode in there because it's better not to have that bigger DC offset. So here's what I ended up doing. Pin 13, which is chroma, goes through our one nanofarad capacitor, through that 75 ohm resistor and out. Pin 14 goes to the base of a 2N2222 transistor. Uh, the collector connects to five volts over here and the emitter goes through our diode and out. And I pretty much just connected the ground wires to this big point here. So they're kind of acting as a pretty dodgy strain relief, but this isn't exactly ideal to begin with. It should at least allow us to get S video out of this thing though. Again, I'll just check this with the debug board first. So, Yep, that all looks pretty good. That's our Luma signal. Seems fine. Our Chroma signal also looks pretty safe. Let's plug it into the retro thing. And it looks like we have S-Video. Let's do a proper test. Looks pretty good. Better than composite, that's for sure. Eh, contrast isn't actually too bad. Oh, that blue. No doubt the noise that's making it into the blue channel on RGB also is affecting uh, the rest of the video outputs. It is what it is. It's, it's not bad for S-Video, I'll give it that. Especially with just a few simple components that we used. I'm sure we could do better, but uh, it would be a lot more complicated. So there it is, S-Video out of the master system. So I think that is it. This has certainly been a very long video. You can just imagine how long it's taken me to film, but I really wanted to get across how to perform some of these mods and different ways of taming analog video signals. So if you're looking at doing this kind of work, um, hopefully this video has helped out and helped you understand a little bit more about it. Or maybe if you're already doing this kind of stuff, Maybe you've picked up a little tip or two. I'd really like to hear about it down in the comments section, but um, hopefully you can apply what you've learned here to different systems. It doesn't have to be the master system. This was just a good console to demonstrate some of these mods, being that it's already got RGB and composite, but they certainly needed quite a bit of work. And also we looked at jail bars, which uh, this system also suffers from. So with any luck, you may be able to sort out jail bars on other consoles, just with the few tips that you may have learned here. But um, I think we should really end this video now because like I said, it's gone on quite a long time and I think I need a little rest. So I think that is it for this one. Hopefully this video has been helpful and maybe somewhat entertaining. And um, if you plan on trying out analog video mods on the master system or anything else for that matter, 
let me know down in the comments section. I'd be interested to hear how you get on. So a massive thanks to the people that support the channel on Patreon. If you want to do the same, links to that are down in the video description. Of course, thank you all for watching, liking, subscribing, all that YouTube bullshit. And I will be back in the next one. Bye.